Close meeting to order at 11.30. Invocation and pledges. Is that yes, Roger? Sir. Roger Campos is going to lead us in our invocation and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help as we are gathered together. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask you that you would clearly show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. Give us the desire to find ways to excel in our work. Help us to work together and encourage each other to excellence. We ask that we would challenge each other to reach higher and farther to be the best we can be. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the United States, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Campos. Anyone signed up for public comments? No? Okay. Uh, consider approval of the resolution dealing with the wage issues for employees involved in the emergency school, school closures. Yes, sir. Uh, due to potential inclement weather, uh, the district shut down on January 20th, February 3rd, and February 4th, 2022. Uh, it was deemed necessary based on the safety of our students and our staff to protect them from possible traveling issues. Uh, and so local policy DEA addresses uh, pay during school closure, uh, and it requires a board resolution to be passed by the school board to pay employees for those days that were under an emergency closure. Uh, it authorizes the district uh, to make payment to any employee staying home from work as a precautionary measure uh, through the action in this district. The district has concluded that pay serves a public purpose, uh, and we're asking the board to approve the resolution dealing with the wage issues involving the emergency closure. I okay. move. We have a motion Sorry. and a second. Any discussion or questions on the resolution dealing with wage issues involving emergency closures for all employees? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Consider approval of board policy CW local. Yes, sir. Uh, I know we've been discussing a new policy for our, uh, I would go into our board local policy. Uh, it's on naming of district facilities. Uh, we currently don't have one in, uh, in our policy. Uh, we've had a couple of options we brought forth, a couple of brown bags. Uh, and today uh, we're, I'm bringing to you two options. Option A uh, includes everything that we've been presenting. I, uh, I think the biggest piece that was under debate was uh, number three, and it's talking about whether we should memorialize or honor someone who is living or non-living. Option A uh, requires or puts in the policy that we will not honor anyone that's living. Uh, it would be somebody that would be after, uh, after life. And option B simply takes three off and doesn't make it an issue. And so there's two options. Everything else is the same, uh, and I know that... At the last meeting, there was, uh, I got um, word for both sides, and so I'm bringing it to you all to decide. Uh, so today, it's, uh, I would ask the board to, uh, and Mr. Vasquez, uh, turn it back over to you. Uh, we okay. have option A and option B to vote on. As, as uh, you just stated, Brandon, uh, it's pretty simple. They're both the same except for number three. Uh, and uh, at this time, uh, anyone have any comments? Is it? Are we doing a motion on this right mm -hmm. now? Yes. Um, it's recommended we... for the board approved uh, one of the options for CW local policy. I move that we do option B. Do we have the options in front of us? Like right yes. 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 Second. Page what? seven, page eight. And I think oh, the, no. the one you want to look at is the board book? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I yes. know it's in the board book. Here. Yeah, I got it right here. Okay, at this time we have a motion for option B. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we motion and a second, and, and we can continue to uh, discuss. Okay, the current motion is on option B, which I'll read option, the difference is three, a facility may be named for a local resi residential or geographic area or a state or national landmark. 
Are you, are you meaning no. for a no, local option resident? Mm -mm. Option A yeah. has the one that, he, that, that would be taken off. Yes, but uh, currently uh, B is uh, what's uh, been yeah. made a motion on. Yeah. Okay, and three would be if choosing to memorialize, A would be if choosing to memorialize a person in the name of, of a facility, the board shall not bestow the honor while the person is living. Any person nominated for a memorial must have made a significant contribution to society or to public education, and his or her name must lend prestige to a facility. And B has it where it doesn't, it's not in there at all. Yeah. Right. We bring recommendations. Okay, I see. At the end of the day, the board approves the recommendation that we're right. from the committee. Yeah. Right. Three. So, in option B, number a three and A is, is totally out. Yeah, I know that. But uh, we don't want to put in option B that the person must have made a significant contribution to society or public I, education. I think that's in that's item in one. I, you know, they're written a little different. I think the best way to look at it is as option A, if chosen, uh, means that a person, we could name a person uh, that, that's still uh, on earth. Option B uh, basically uh, leaves it open for uh, either naming a position. But it does on number one on option B, it does say <coughs> they had to have made a significant difference in, in the educational uh, for children. Okay. I thought that was the opposite, actually. Yeah. I thought A is it the opposite? It's the opposite. Yes. A, they have to be. A, they have to be living. I mean, they have to be deceased. I'm sorry. And yeah. B, it's not a. It's not. Yeah. We're not but saying it, yeah. either or. But I, yeah. I hear what I think. What I is saying is in action A, the three second part. If we take out the memorialize, any person nominated for a memorial must have made a significant contribution to society or to public education, and his or her name must lend prestige to facility. That statement in itself is not an option B. Correct. But we can add it in. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you can tell me, and we can whatever we approve today. Would you like to move for a friendly amendment? I think. I mean, I, like, I don't mind option B, but uh, I I kind of like that. That line. Wording, that sentence. Uh, that line. Make it an option B. Make a significant Yolanda, would you be okay with adding that one sentence? Yes. As a number five. Mm -hmm. I would. Well, I would put that three in there and eliminate the first sentence. And then three and four become four and five. You're just trying to be more difficult. Okay. <laughs> I totally, I think we all understand what the motion is now. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing that, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Thank you. Okay. I think now we go to items of information. Item A. <laughs> Aquatic Center update on staffing operations and programming. Yes, sir. As, as you guys know, uh, we're coming to uh, the end of uh, our construction project. Hopefully, before we start the next school year, everything says that it happened. So it's uh, really important as we get into uh, our budget planning, which Mr. Chris is going to go through later on, uh, that we be able to present some operational facets of what that uh, aquatic center as it's going to have in the form of financial expectation programming and things like that. And so uh, Brandon and uh, Coach Wagner, uh, Coach Rodriguez, have been really working on making sure that we can bring uh, what that's going to look like, what we think it's going to look like, and what we think some of those operational costs are going to be associated with that building. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Brandon. And so I just wanted to share with the team and with the school board that uh, as we've been working through the Natatorium and the actual project construction project, these gentlemen have been a part of that team uh, and leading that. Uh, we actually have through our architect and consultant that uh, we work with on pools and how to operate pools. And at the same time, we we're going to hire somebody that has a lot of experience with that. And know uh, Coach Wagner and his team have gone and traveled and saw other natatoriums and how they operate. And so today, we've asked them to come and share with you uh, what our vision is for the pool and how we're going to operate it. Uh, it's going to require staffing and there's some operational pieces in that. Uh, and at the same time, we have an agreement with the city of San Antonio that we have to have it open so many minutes and there's a, we're working through that to see what that looks like and working with their team to, to meet that need. Uh, we're going to probably vastly exceed that, uh, but we have to at the same time understand how do we serve our students, 
um, first, and then what programs are we implementing for all of our students, and then how we're going to be using it for the community. So I'm going to turn over to Coach Wagner. Uh, I'm just going to put a collaborative of effort to kind of give you an idea of what, what the vision is and where we're going with it as we open it up in, hopefully in June. All right, sir. So I'm not going to talk a lot for once when I get up here, but um, mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Rini Rodriguez, who's our um, Assistant Athletic Director of Aquatics. Um, just want to, a quick note is, as, as Mr. Crisp said, we, we did go around a lot um, throughout all over, the, all over the state to visit a lot of different aquatics programs, saw some really neat ones, saw some that we thought they weren't really utilizing it as well, um, and then kind of developed our vision for our community. Obviously, we know where we're at, how much we got to build and things like that. And so what we put together um, for our staffing and things is, along the lines of getting us in the next few years to a spot where our community sees it, it's really valuing our community, it's bringing value to our community, and secondly, it's building an aquatics program that, that is going to host great events, big events, um, and then secondly, is going to produce uh, things that, that when you talk to Mac, you Mac and those guys that, that they'll be proud of that they were looking for and how well we compete, not just in on the south side of town, but throughout the state of Texas. And uh, and Rini Rodriguez has been, been to a few places that they do those things. Um, the programs that we're going to show you today are meant to, uh, we think, we'll build that pretty quick. And so um, I want to turn it over to Rini to, to give you all of those. Thank you all for inviting us here. Uh, just a... Uh, information on the aquatics program these are all proposals as far as what we'd like to do and just to man it and uh, continue to have greatness with the, the facility as well as, as well as the southwest um, Pete kind of went over the vision and it's pretty much uh, the same as southwest has been uh, before I got here but encompassing in that with swimming is, is a big part of what I'd like to do as well um, not just growing the program with swimming, water polo, and diving, but also encompassing uh, our elementary students, our middle school, trying to bring all that in one big uh, area and, and growing it together as well as the community. So that vision is encompassing all of that. <clears throat> uh, the programs that we'd like to bring are high school, uh, middle school, again, the elementary school, and then club programs to bring in revenue and then the community access. That's a big part of what we have to offer here as well, and we'd like to do that here. So starting off with the, the high school, a uh, big part that would change would be coming in the mornings to allow for the other programs to, to happen. Right now they are in the afternoon, so having them come in the morning would allow them access to other programs. So having them come in the morning, which would be Something that we'd like to do is the middle school, which is not done with a lot of programs within San Antonio or even the bigger cities. I saw this a lot more in the smaller communities, and they were very successful in bringing their program up to the level of, let's say, a Dallas team or a team that is very competitive quicker because of the middle school programming. And that's something we'd like to do as well. Bring them at the end of their day, 3.30, to do their, their practices. The elementary schools would be also involved in this, and it's more of a water safety and a basic learn to swim program, getting them excited about swimming. Not only the kids, but the parents as well. They would have to come, or they most likely would come to the facility as well, see the, the facility in awe. I know a lot of kids, when they first see it for the first time, it's a big pool. And for them being in a little uh, bathtub or a small pool in their neighborhood, this is humongous. And so getting that feel of awe and excitement for them is going to be a big thing, and it will help the community as well with that because of the programming. <clears throat> so uh, one of the programs that we'd like to look at was the elementary, which is the Water Safety Learn to Swim. So this is very uh, close to what we'd like to do with this program. It'd be a Monday through Friday program. They'd come every day, and it would be about an hour and 40 minutes from their day. Very similar to what you were doing already with Palo Alto, um, 
but this would be ours. This would be Southwest's program. So they would be coming to our facility and the programming we would teach them would be our program. So um, they would have staff in the water, guard on, on the deck, as well as the teacher would also be present to help with any uh, issues that we would have. Example of the day, mm -hmm. uh, they would start off at the campus getting all the do's and don'ts, the rules, and then from there it would be uh, coming to the facility and seeing um, water safety and then the water skills. The very last day is important for this because of the fact that we want to leave a, a positive impression when it comes to the elementary kids and getting them excited about it. So doing a swim check and maybe going off the board, having fun in the water, getting a smile and positive feeling right at when they leave the facility is always good. <clears throat> uh, types of revenue that we'd like to bring would all, uh, be the club swimming, club diving, club water polo. We'd host uh, several events. Uh, two per month, uh, given the season, and uh, for the most part, that would be what we'd be doing, uh, except for when we're not in season, which is only, I think, uh, a month that we would not be in season. Uh, rentals, we would also bring in other high school possibilities, colleges, neighboring colleges that are interested in having a team or any programming, corporate events, we have the airport, airlines, military, uh, fire, all those different venues that would be wanting some type of water safety or uh, teaching of some kind of uh, training that they would need, as well as the DPS, uh, all those different venues that are always looking for a place. So that's one of the ways we get revenue. Obviously, with our community as well, we'd offer a lap swimming, water aerobics, water yoga, all these different venues that we'd like to pursue. Summer lessons would be big in the summer, obviously and then the general swimming during the public, for the public during the summer as well. We'd also offer Red Cross classes, not just CPR, but lifeguarding classes to the community as well, not just for our staff. This is what a day would look like during the school day, um, or the school uh, schedule. Uh, adaptive pool is our smaller learn to swim pool. So if you see, we would be busy from 7 to 8.30. And then the competitive pool would actually have two pools in it, just depending on, on where things were. We'd be able to offer lap swimming, have our high school programming. Uh, the rentals would be in either one of those pools uh, during that time. Uh, come back for our middle school club teams and then our water aerobics or water yoga at the end of the day. The gym is a uh, access for all the dry land activity, not just the weight room, but also the uh, small room right next to it, which would be the classroom. You could utilize it as a yoga uh, area, different things like that for uh, core classes, all those wellness programs that we could <laughs> offer, not just to the public, but to our employees and give them access to that as well. And it's not being used for our high school programs. <clears throat> the summer would look very similar, but it would be offering more access to the public and general swimming as well as uh, rentals. In order to do all these different venues, uh, the recommendation for these positions, um, I, I would like to uh, present these positions for that to be able to run all those different events and different uh, activities that we'd like to have at our facility. And going through this, we uh, would have uh, different parts of that for the facility as well as the administrative, the coaching staff, and your basic custodial and, and uh, lifeguarding. Uh, the current position we have right now is me, which is the Assistant Athletic Director of Aquatics, and um, I, I consider myself as the principal of this school, and, and I, it would be everything that we'd be running through there, I would try and help with that as well as not just the budgeting or the managing of the day-to-day -day operations, but everything that, that would go through this facility. So uh, that's really what we're asking for and uh, proposing to you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Um, is the lap swim included here, the general swimming for the community? Is there going to be a time space for just community open swim without the lap? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Our, our plan is probably like on, on the weekends during the school year, 
um, probably on Saturday as well, depending on if we're hosting a, a meet and those kinds of things. But that's the plan is to have it open for the community. Okay. In the summer, would it be for just like one or two hours, or are we looking at three, four, no, five, six like hours? It would be like your normal like city pool. Type oh, great. Thing. Okay. But we'll do. We'll get the the club stuff done done in the morning mm -hmm. with your with your water aerobics and things like that. And then we'll get the other club stuff done in the evening, and then the middle is where you take care of mm -hmm. the, the open thing. So. Cool. What is the plan to uh, build the club swim in our area? Like, do you have a, so, a publicity plan? You know, I know club swim's super big on the north side, and we, I don't think it, we don't have community pools mm -hmm. in our area. So what is the plan to build that? Right, you have very few community pools in your area. Um, you, the ones that you do have are in neighborhoods yeah. that are closed. When we were looking for places to rent, those are the places that I went, and there's very few. Yeah. Um, and, but it was closer to the north side that you would see those. Mm -hmm. um, and being a part of uh, the north side of town or the northeast, I'm very familiar with the Alamo Area Aquatics Programming, which is a club team. And it encompasses north side and northeast, mm -hmm. San Antonio, Alma Heights. Um, I've already been requesting to be a part of that and uh, trying to uh, fill the gap that Palo Alto is not doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Since they are down, um, I've already talked to them about being a part of that and bringing that part of our club program. So that would be something that we'd want to pursue. Yeah, um, so something that would go into the elementary schools. Right. And just, I mean, that in order for them to be competitive, they're going to have to be club swimmers. So the our staffing that we're presenting um, goes into that as well to build that. <coughs> One, two, the, uh, the swimming lessons that Irene talked about are that last day is where we identify some of those swimmers. Um, that, and that happened when we did it at Palo Alto and like Kevin Van Hecke and those guys. Mm -hmm. When they were swimming, they, would, they, got, they got seen that way. Yeah. And stuff. And so that's kind of the idea of that last day with the second graders to get them into that early program with, and then we build them from there mm -hmm. in the quad A stuff. It's also why our middle school um, thought is really big in that we have sixth graders in there that they're just looking for something to do at the middle school. All their seventh and eighth grade friends are doing it. Right. So we would start it as a club. But those kids who aren't doing those things, we have an entire plan from from introducing them to water polo to they'll have meet uh, we'll do swim meets all the way through the end of the year so kids that are going into football they get out of that they can go do that after school and they go to a different so we starting to learn how to do that we learned that from Andrews we went up to West Texas and Andrews they have a top state um, 4A program but they share all of their kids right. which is why we went up there and um, you know they're looking at trying to win the Florida State title this year and so uh, but they really utilize the middle school program. They built that to about 100 kids. So we take it from the middle school program and bring them into Quad A, which leads them into another program, and that's where we get better at it. And then also the um, special needs population, um, especially the children that have autism that are like drawn to the water, and then you just read that they've drowned because they don't know how to swim. Um, we should have plenty of time during the day to offer those kinds of things to not just second grade, but I mean, the older high school mm -hmm. special needs, the whole special needs arena needs to be like sort of a priority to teach mm -hmm. them, you know, and if that means bringing in special instructors for certain times of the year, incorporating our swim team, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's not during regular school, just tell the parents, hey, we're going to have our swim team at the swim thing and then bring your kid you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that we have right. a real opportunity to build that um that safety issue with our kids yeah. so i just wanted to when we get into the budget piece i'm going to talk about how this impacts budget i know they've been listed and so uh it's going to be a great facility there's a lot of things we can do uh it's going to require personnel uh it's i know we talked about we talked about penguin project you know, we have a lot of vision on what it should look like in the end, but we're going to have to take some steps and, and we're going to be able to pivot. Uh, and so really it's going to be based on who we can find, who we can hire, uh, what that looks like. 
uh, what our, you know, at the end of the day, what our community is really looking for once we start getting this thing mm -hmm. open. Uh, so uh, they put together a vision, which I think is a great vision, but at the same time, we'll have to pivot, we'll have to make changes, we'll have to, you know, and so as we open it, uh, it's not going to look like that day one, uh, but I think that our vision is in the next two to three years to really do a really great program in our high schools, sports, and everything else will supplement that. Mm -hmm. If we do all these things that we're talking about, that's going to help build up our high school programs, but also it's going to be uh, something that we can hang a hat on the south side of San Antonio to look at our facilities and look over there. I uh, appreciate them putting it together. They did spend a lot of time traveling, a lot of meetings, uh, and so we're getting close. Uh, we've got a couple months away to open it. Uh, and we'll get started. So, Brandon, um, operational costs. I see there's a, a, pull, a pull comparison. So how would we be compared into to the operational costs? Uh, so we, we have a pool consultant uh, that we're working with through our architect uh, that is basically working with us to determine that. So as we get closer to, uh, when I say operational costs, it's going to be well, electricity. Mm -hmm. you know, it's enough add to the CPS, water. Uh, then you have your chemicals. And so we're working on building that. I have a preliminary budget that I'll share with you. Uh, so we have a staffing model, just like a, a campus, right? We have the staffing, the staffing, and then we're gonna have an operational. What is it gonna cost us? And we have to buy supplies, when we have to buy chemicals, when we have to get the power, all those things. And so uh, different aquatic centers are different. There's different sizes. Some are smaller, some are huge. Uh, some have multiple pools, and so it's a little different. And so we're trying to build a model based on our pool and people that have a pool like us. Uh, mm -hmm. Our pool is gonna look more like Northeast Walker Pool. Mm -hmm. It's about that size. And so we kind of got ideas from them on what they do. Uh, the staffing piece is as, as far as we want to go. Like we're gonna need a lot of lifeguards. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're gonna need we're trying to we need coaches, we need a guide coach, we don't have one. Uh, we, we're gonna we're gonna work through those things to figure out. But operational is something like we have never ran a facility like this before. Uh, but the idea is to see what that is on paper. Uh, and do we have any idea what the charges are going to be to enter the pool? Or? Well, and that's another conversation to take with the district because I know in the past we've talked about charging for different things and we really don't. Like mm -hmm. there's no other athletic, we don't charge. Club might be a little different because you're going to have to hire club coaches and they're going to be part of a program that's going to cost a fee just like select baseball and these mm -hmm. other programs. But I don't know what we want to, we'll have to decide what we're going to charge. Like, what are we going to charge somebody to come do last year? We do a monthly fee of ten bucks, or do we not do anything? Yeah. Those are things that we'll have to sit down. And I don't think we need to go that route at the, the beginning, but at some point we want to try to get some revenue because I'm going to show you really. Uh, we're talking about a million dollars a year to run this facility. Well, it should be competitive with what everybody else uh, charges. I mean. What I know that we, <laughs> we we want to think that, but at the same time, I think uh, economics is different. Right. Yeah, we, yeah, we want to be. Uh, the city and the charge at Northside. But the amount, the, the amount of uh, that we're going to be spending, you know, it, it's the same. The cost will be the same. Correct. It is, it is, you are correct. So. Brandon, do we have any idea of how much revenue we could uh, make from the external, like people wanting to rent our facilities for their own events? Do we have even a baseline number of there, revenue? There is. We have some data that other districts do, but we're going to have to really break through that because, mm -hmm. I mean, they, some districts charge everybody, everybody, even community members that come to us, right? So right, so that's what I'm saying. That. If we we're, can, con, uh, if we could consider uh, charging, uh, uh, you know, outside entities, yeah. so that we can finance our internal customers, right? Yeah. And so like high school programs, like we, they charge us to go swim in their pool, but we, right. we will charge other school districts Correct. to come use our facilities, colleges. I mean, that will be. We'll have a rental fee. Mm -hmm. Uh, you I just don't, don't know if, what what the demand's going to be. Correct. I mean, there's going to be a demand for especially high schools around this area. Gonna, okay. And there's nowhere to go. We, I've talked to Our Lady of the Lake uh, athletic director a few times. They're looking at adding swimming solely because we're building these schools. Oh, that's great. On this side. Well, ideally, we would want we would want to get the revenue from those kinds of entities to finance our own community, right? right. So what I'd like to add to this conversation, this is like the opening of the conversation to kind of show what we want to do. As part of our budget workshops, this is always going to be a component of the budget workshops that we bring you all. There's going to be a revenue side to it. There's going to be an expend expenditure side to it. I know in the presentation Brandon has later on this morning, uh, he's also going to give our best guesstimate of what the operational cost is going to be and kind of gross. But as we come back in, in March, April, and May, you're going to see that broken down even further mm -hmm. as we learn more. 
we will not bring anything without doing our research. Uh, Palo Alto normally charges for uh, lane rental fees or what they charge to clubs. Uh, what we know some other um, ISDs who have had these facilities for a long time, what they've been able to do. Um, and so we're going to bring uh, the data every time, and every time it's going to come further off the funnel uh, down to, to a little more specific information. So, I mean, they're all really great questions and, yeah. and things that I know that you guys have been throwing around and talking about as well every time uh, you come to senior staff. And, and we speak about it, so yeah. And and Brenda, when you talk about pivots, what are you what are you talking to? Really? When, when you when you start something and it's not working, mm -hmm. you try to pivot and maybe go down another route. Like uh, based on staffing, right? We hired somebody. We think that's going to work for us and because it worked at Northside. It may not work for us that way. So we may have to do something different that meets our needs. So when I say pivot. It's like we live in a world where we're, we're pivoting all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why it comes to mind. One model. Yeah. So what, what we've learned from other everywhere else, we, we're going to try to implement a lot of that, but we're going to have to adjust it as we go on. Through Find the strike. A lot of it may be boiled down to who we hire and what staffing's out there and who we can use and what we learn as we get better. We definitely want this to be an opportunity for our our youth, our students, to have employment opportunities. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of credentialing you can do for, around water and and, and lifeguarding and and uh, just different type of training. You can. Mm -hmm even uh, swim instructors. And so we definitely want to put our, our community and our, our students uh, on the forefront of every opportunity we create. So, but all of the employees for Life Park to sample will go through the steps that they go through at all the other pools. They have to test, Correct. et cetera, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll because it has, they have to be knowledgeable. Right. And, and, and we host that. So, so Amy's actually a Life Park instructor. So mm -hmm. we'll teach them all through and right. most of them. The main people we hire will be able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. So I just want to throw a, a reminder, Brett, uh, Homero used to be a diver, too, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's true. <laughs> just real quick, just so that we had our realignment, so I'll let Coach Wagner, like, in three minutes, high level, go through what mm -hmm. it looks like. So, so basically, high level wise football, um, we traded out. Um, we basically got rid of 255 miles one way from Rio Grande City and, and, and took up the six mile drive to South San. And then um, we also added our friends in Medina Valley. Um, that's, that's our football district, our basketball and volleyball district. Um, it didn't change other than, again, we switched out Floresville for South San. And so it's kind of nice now that basically um, our our high school district in foot and volleyball and, and basketball is pretty much looks exactly like our middle school um, conference. So mm -hmm. our kids are playing the same kids all the way through like we wanted it 10 years ago. Um, so that's what it looks like right now. Um, last thing is our, that is our football schedules that are already ready to go next year. You'll see that the Fire and Armor Bowl is the last game of the season. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be played at Legacy mm -hmm. this year. Um, and then that is my last slide is by on the ball is on I think I no, I think but I'm pretty sure it's eleven forty. That it's a Friday night the last game of the season. Mm -hmm. yeah. at Titan Stadium. Oh, I like that being the last game. So, All right. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Yep. Okay, uh, before we go on to item B. Uh, Lloyd forgot to remind us about lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. I so, so we're going to take about a, like a five-minute break. <laughs> Go serve yourselves. Come back, and then we'll continue. We're on break. With item B, item six B, National Board Certified Teacher Two-Year Candidacy Support Cohort. Yes, sir. We, we have Ms. Frances Barsonez who's going to bring that information. Um, we all know that there's a, a, a big em emphasis uh, towards uh, teacher credentials and being able to get a, a national teacher certification uh, is, is a pathway we want to create here at Southwest ISD and also in Region 20. And so Ms. Barsonez has really uh, been working to make sure we can identify a, a cadre of folks to join the cohort at Region 20, so she'll do a presentation. Uh, there's no ask today. We just want the board to know uh, the work that's going on. If there is some ask, we will be coming back to the board with an action item in the future. That was a great intro. That gave you the, the whole crux of it. Um, basically, as a part of our talent management, grow our own initiative, 
and working with the Texas State uh, Teachers Incentive Allotment. We wanted to ensure that Southwest ISD has, was on the cutting edge of having national board certified teachers. These teachers will automatically, after they receive their certification, receive the TIA bonus um, up to almost $32,000 on top of their teacher pay when they qualify. It is a two-year commitment, and so through our partnership with Region 20, um, we are going to be able to train 10 teachers through their initial programming and piloting of this program. And with that, we are um, going through a series of um, recommendations from self-recommendations from the teachers, uh, interest levels from the teachers, recommendations from CNI through observations and data through uh, scores and assessments. We want to ensure that we have enough national teachers that they can mentor future national wow. teachers and we start growing our own capacity within our district. We hope that this will exponentially grow year after year, but we would like to start this baseline with our 10 teachers um, right now and we're midway through a process of recommending them. Thank you, Francis. Any questions for them? What does this process entail? The process basically entails um, a partnership with Region 20. Uh, Region 20 has selected mentors depending on what grade level or what subject areas the teachers teach, and they will be receiving a mentor for that specific area. There's um, four basic components to the National Teacher Certification, and so they will mentor them through getting all of those approved until they're finally able to assess them through a one-on-one -on -one either virtual or in-person um, assessment where they come and observe like a teacher observation. And then after they um, pass that or get their feedback to be able to improve that to pass it later, uh, they will be credentialed um, nationally and then we apply to the state and they will be able to take that certification with them as a teacher of a, um, with that certification. There's, so, a, there's a state and national movement to really move teacher salaries to a whole new level. Uh, this is one of those pathways uh, mm -hmm. for those teachers who, who, who commit uh, to this rigorous pathway to be able to get that, that level of salary. There's also a benefit for our students who have been identified uh, during the pandemic, coming back, mm -hmm. getting through the pandemic for high impact tutoring. Uh, those students do not have to be in high impact tutoring if they're in a the classroom with a national certified teacher. Uh, that would be in lieu of having to do the additional thing. So there's another benefit uh, from getting uh, our teachers into that pathway and getting into that, that program. So it's a start. It's a start for Region 20 as well. It's going to be their first time uh, in starting a full heart here uh, locally and uh, kind of getting folks. Do we pay? Uh, do we pay to put our teachers through this program? We will pay the cost of it, and then we will do um, similar to what we did with the master's degree program. We will ask that those teachers commit to Southwest mm -hmm. uh, for a limited number of time and years, yeah. and then we will also uh, allow them to understand that we might need to move them to uh, schools that are in school improvement because mm -hmm. we would like to have those teachers um, mm -hmm. come into other schools and help improve and impact learning. We had um, teachers come to the Region 20 open session that we posted in the district area with um, a lot of excitement. They're, they're ready for it. It is arduous. It's going to take two years of a commitment. I was going to ask, and how, what is the cost and, and the length of time, two years? It's two years. And it's going to cost our district $19,000 for those two years to be committed to that. Per, per teacher? No, $19,000. For all of them? Uh -huh. Oh, that's good. And so as we're a part of this program, and then it may... Um, we're piloting it, so it may be more or less, but we're also looking for other alternatives on top of that because we would like to exponentially grow that, right. that potential. So how many people does that include? How many teachers? Ten, ten the first year. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, quickly, um, just for reading parents that are going to ask, what's the difference for them between being state certified and, the, and then paying, us paying out of pocket to be nationally certified? What all that would entail being different? So say that one. So time. what's the difference between just being, you know, a regular teacher, regular teacher, teacher Texas okay. certified compared to national? So to for this particular program, um, this is part of what the teachers get. So there are uh, there's many different methods, or two or three different methods, where a teacher can get additional pay from the state. It doesn't okay. come from our district. Okay. 
pot of money comes from the state. If you are a nationally board certified teacher, mm -hmm. the state of Texas pays that stipend to you of up to $32,000. So we would not have to pay that out. It doesn't come from the district. It pays straight through us to that teacher. It improves the teacher to almost making a six-figure salary mm -hmm. for being an exceptional teacher on a campus. Mm -hmm. That's the difference of that. Now, they can take their national cert and work anywhere, DODs and other places. Um, I think it's uh, used in 16 other states as a certification process. So that kind of tells you where you're sitting with that. As far as the, what concerns us is that teacher um, being nationally certified mm -hmm. improves our um, rigor, improves mm -hmm. our instructional, because all of that has to be tested and assessed. Mm -hmm. So it improves instruction at tier one level, mm -hmm. tier two level, and tier three level. It mm -hmm. improves all of that. Yeah. In addition, we don't have to put aside additional monies for extra tutoring to meet the 4545 requirement, mm -hmm. because every child in there will meet their minutes based on having that teacher as a teacher of record. So it helps improve that fiscal impact for the district mm -hmm. and the cost output for how much it costs versus what we're going to get back yeah. is no Return question. Are we Absolutely. focusing on certain grades or is it just across the board? Uh, right now we looked across the board because oh. we would like to have both secondary and elementary, okay. but we're still considering uh, what the best method mm -hmm. um, after looking at all their data. And right now that's a um, partnership between AHR, uh, CNI, mm -hmm. and their principals. Okay. And does this include like um, people, uh, teachers who teach uh, disabilities and stuff like that? Are we going to look into that too? Or is it just one like section where it's all going to be like math, science, and stuff for, for that nature to be nationally certified? We actually opened it up to everybody. There's, I believe, 16 different elements from CT all the way down. Um, you would select as the teacher which area in which you would like to focus your certification, mm -hmm. and that's where you would go. We do have teachers who are recommended who are special ed teachers and teachers of other electives. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting um, who ends up at the end wanting to commit for two years. Mm -hmm because it's two years of working outside of what you normally do um, to get this done because it is very rigorous. Is Are it, there qualifications for the teachers to be elected? Uh, is there, do they have to meet certain criteria? For national teacher certification uh, region 20, it's based on who we select. Mm -hmm. That's why we're making sure we're doing a vetting process to ensure that these are people who want to stay here at Southwest and that want to invest that time, who've shown a leadership and um, dedication to their craft, and that who also have shown um, the work ethic to, to be a teacher who can work with other teachers. Mm -hmm. Because even if you're the best teacher, but you don't like working with other teachers, you can't mentor my next group. So we need, mm -hmm. we need both of that. Right. That's great. The best way, I think, to realize like, what's the difference. Like, one way to look at kind of a high level is Sometimes you go like a, a mile wide and inch deep, and I think a national search is a mile wide and mile deep. Uh, that's the, the idea. You have this kind of pedagogy training. Mm -hmm. You have content in Texas, but then you get this additional pedagogy that allows you to be very effective in tier one, tier two, tier three, cross curriculum uh, training, and, and being able to um, address the needs of the students in real time, as opposed to having students pulled out and getting them to the yeah. I think that's. Like high level, we can definitely get the difference between the state and the national terms of that the traits of life characteristic. Um, I think that's a kind of a general way to look at it. So they're kind of doing something. That's perfect because I know that that'll be one of the yeah, questions we'll ask. Well, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's what I did to describe it. And I think Region 20 is learning. We're all stepping in and learning uh, along with them. And so it's going to be new. Uh, mm -hmm. so we're going to be ready to finish. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. That's exciting. Thank you. Okay, and now even more exciting, running Chris with our budget oh, update. Oh, oh. <laughs> so this is not going to be uh, <laughs> the brightest presentation that you're going to see all year. <laughs> Uh, but I'd just like to kind of uh, put some guardrails on the presentation. Uh, Brandon is going to give you real data of where we are, what, what this uh, operating in this pandemic uh, is doing to us specifically as a district. Or now, 
I don't think we're much different or no different than any other ISDs who are going through uh, this financial kind of uh, time where we have additional funds coming in from the federal, but we got to be careful not to create this artificial cliff in a couple of years. And so um, it's not going to be the prettiest picture, but there are some bright spots that um, he's going to cover at the end of his presentation. But we just feel that you guys need uh, real data, uh, uh, factual data, uh, and that's subject to change depending on what the state of Texas does as well. So, okay. You have this little fancy handout in front of you just in case it, the numbers don't, because I have a lot of numbers today, so I, I apologize for that, because uh, I really wanted to give you kind of the state of affairs on the finance side of where we are right now based on our data. Uh, it's different. I will, I will preface this by saying, as far as attendance, this is probably about any part of the pandemic, this has been the worst year for us. Uh, even when we first started, because the state had mechanisms in place to protect us. Mm -hmm. They took those away, they stripped those away, and now we're kind of on our own in dealing with attendance. So that's going to be pretty much the, uh, I don't know what to call it a crutch, but the problem we're seeing when we look at uh, on our finances. Mm -hmm. I will share that our budget is about 70% uh, based on state funding. So we do have taxpayers that pay in, and we have taxpayer money that we collect. Uh, we collect about $56 million overall. Uh, tax collection seems to be doing fine. Mm -hmm. But the rest of our budget, uh, remember our budget is about $145 million, comes from the state of Texas. The state of Texas funds us based on students. Uh, and so students sitting in seats. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk briefly about, you have this page here, shows where our enrollment is as of snapshot. Uh, we're currently sitting about 13,200 students. And on the next slide, I gave you an idea of where we were Two years ago, before the pre-pandemic snapshot, we were sitting at 13.8. If you remember, we had from about 2015 to 2019, we were really growing at a good percentage, and so we were sitting at 13.8. So the difference there is about almost five, 600 kids. Where we're seeing the impact is going to be our early house, the elementary. That's where we're seeing the biggest impact. And now we're starting to fill a little bit in our middle schools. Uh, as those cohorts that we started to push through the elementary start to enter sixth grade, You'll notice here in sixth grade, two years ago, we had over a thousand, and we're sitting below that. And that will continue, and that trend will continue as these cohorts start to move into the upper house, mm -hmm. impacting us. The high schools have really felt uh, state level or even added. Uh, the biggest difference, and I'll talk about enrollment versus uh, average daily attendance, is our high schools are really struggle with average daily attendance even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. that we're, the elementary kids came to school, high schools, they're always dealing with attendance. It's a little bit harder to get the, the older students to come on, a, on an average daily. And so really, when you look at it, I'm talking about attendance and what that, how that's impacting. Just some demographics, and I bring it up because our enrollment is dropping. Uh, and you can see, and you can look at that yourself. But you'll see through our special populations, and I'll, and I'm a, I'll, I'll just pick my special ed. Two years ago, our population of special ed was about 14%, and now it's at 17. So even though we have lower enrollment, we're having uh, our special populations are growing. What that means is it's when you have special populations, you get a little more funding for them, but you also need more staff uh, and more resources. And so as those things have the enrollments decrease, we are seeing an increase in some of those demographics. Uh, staffing wise, uh, go back three years ago. This is a, a picture of how many teachers we had in 1920 all We had 950 teachers. And through staffing over time, we've adjusted that based on our enrollment. So last year we were at 957, and then we went through staffing last year, and some, some staff had to be reduced based on their enrollment. But then we added teachers back to that because of COVID. So if you remember, I came to the board and we added at every elementary, every middle mm -hmm. school, and every high school, ESSER positions. And those are currently being fun out of ESSER, which is another thing that we have to have a strategy on. Mm -hmm. And so as our enrollments decrease, we've actually increased our staffing because we need to, to respond to the pandemic. Uh, and that's happened across the board. And that's pretty much all districts. Mm -hmm. Hiring more teachers, social workers, nurses, mm -hmm. clerks, uh, different positions that we felt we needed to help us get through the pandemic. But that's being covered, right? That's being covered right now with our extra funds uh, and with basically just maintaining mm -hmm. uh, what we have. So what this looks like, uh, every six weeks I run a report that's in our system and it's based on our data on what does our attendance look like for our special ed students, what does our attendance look like for just the average daily attendance. And this goes by campus. 
And so when I did budget, I came to the budget workshop and throughout last year, I know I talked about trying to predict our ADA. Mm -hmm. What is it going to look like? We had bad trend data, we were dealing with pandemic, we don't know how the pandemic is going to go away or they're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, we were coming out of July and the, the Delta variant, we weren't sure. So I budgeted us being at a 12,462 ADA which is lower than what we've ever had before, yeah. but it was a conservative number on the lower end so that we can have a budget. Mm -hmm. Well, our ADA currently right now sits at 11.3. Ouch. Uh, oh, my so that's goodness. About a, so I was way off, uh, but at the same time, we couldn't predict Omicron. We didn't predict that mm -hmm. we were having a virtual program that was going to last longer than it has. So there's some factors that we've done. But we, and I say this, the fact that we knew that we were going to do that, and we have solutions for those, but I just wanted to give you an update of what our data is showing us right now. So, when I brought you a budget to adopt uh, in August, so I was projecting that that 12 quarter would put us at $86 million coming from the foundation school program. So $86 million is what I was thinking that we were going to get from the state. If this number was, would hold true or be in the, I'm never an exact scientist mm -hmm. in this area. But when I go back into the formula and I put the actual ADA in, that number drops to 76 million. Mm -hmm. So that means we're basically tracking about $10 million different mm -hmm. from the projected revenue from the state of Texas. So Brandon, I have a question before we go further. Yes, I was a little confused. Um, so you're saying that we don't include the virtual learners in the ADA? They, they are not, uh, they're, no. it's not funded. Okay. Uh, so when we decided to do that, I brought what that would cost us, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean we could still move forward because we felt like it was a need. But we also have a solution for that. We have extra funds to help cover that. Mm -hmm. I only bring this up because the virtual program is not sustainable because sooner or later our extra funds. And I say that at this point of what we don't know. Right. The state of Texas might come out with a, mm -hmm. something, a funding mechanism for us to do it. And if we want to do it, this is how you do it. Uh, they did come out with some things. That you could do virtually, but a lot of our kids didn't meet the criteria. We had to set our own criteria before they come out. Usually the state figures it out and it's already too late for mm -hmm. already move forward. Right. Uh, and so, just to give you an idea what that looks like, so our basic school allowance is basically the $6,100 that we get per student per year, which is average is like $33 a day. Uh, because of our ADA, we're, we're down about $6.2 million just in the basic school allotment. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the biggest bucket. And then you go across, and I put some of the bigger ones there, but there's a lot of different allotments. That there's a transportation allotment, there's a uh, dyslexia allotment, there's different allotments that we get funding for based on our students. But see, these are some of the big ones. SEE, which is our comp ed funds, I was projecting about 17.1 million. Well, that's only about 16.3 based on our, our students. And so that's like almost, a, I want mean, to say a million, 800,000. And then the bilingual program, the, the CTE program. And so you see that our ADA or everything attendance impacting all our budgets. Mm -hmm. and, and I, what I don't have up here, which is not in here, is like our food service. We're serving less uh, lunches and breakfasts, and that's all strictly based on how many, we get revenue based on how much we feed. Uh, we have title funds that are impacted by students and for the lower enrollment and also where they sit. Uh, the bright side, the solutions, and we have these in our back pocket, which makes it okay right now. If we mm -hmm. didn't have these, I would be really freaking out. I would be, mm -hmm. We'd be in trouble. <laughs> but we do have Esther 2, uh, of a tune of about 13.8, which we've already put in strategies to start reclassing uh, salaries. The biggest way to make up deficits is going to be salaries. I mean, that's 80% of our budget. Uh, and so we, we're reclassing things that we can, PPE items, we're no longer buying them at our local budget. We're using everything we can within the realms to pay for things that we need. Uh, but Esther 2 uh, is going to cover us, and that's the first pot of money we need to use because that's the one that needs to be used first. And so we're, we're reclassing salaries. Uh, all the virtual teachers that are teaching virtually are now mm -hmm. going to be funded out of SR2. Mm -hmm. uh, staff across the district, certain areas are being funded out of SR2 uh, because to make up that $10 million deficit. Uh, and then SR3, we have another pot of money that's there for us. Uh, I put SR3 there. I put $24 million, and that's what we have left. We had $32. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that we have about $4.2 million that we're funding out of that, and that's, that's staff that we have added. And so for every year we have that staff, that's going to cost us 4.2 out of this budget. So we got to come up with a strategy uh, to give our campuses what they need, but at the same time be, uh, be cognizant that in three years, that bucket 
is gone. Mm -hmm. What do we do with that $4.2 million? Because that could easily be <coughs> and compound our problems. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to come up with a strategy during staffing on what that looks like over the next three years. Uh, we gave the campuses those staffing to get through the pandemic, to help them through the pandemic, but it's not a long-term, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, unless the state comes in. I, I'm not saying all this because you know, I don't know what the state of Texas is going to do in the next couple of months, into next year, to help us deal with this pandemic. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, through people before me and Dr. Versus and you all, we've been very good with our funds, and we've added the fund balance, and that's what's good. So uh, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, if we had to go into reserve, we have fifty three million dollars sitting there, and we'll use some of it as we go through this. Uh, and so I will start by saying that when we adopted the budget, if you recall, we were already in deficit. We did a raise and we did some things and so already had a budget that was 3.9 in, in the red. Uh, and so if I add on the revenue deficit that I have, I'm actually about $14 million under budget on the revenue side. That being said, it doesn't mean we're going to spend every dollar. There's people we haven't hired that we couldn't find, so salaries is going to be a lot less. We don't spend the whole utility budget. There's usually savings there. Not everybody spends every dollar of their budget that I give them. So. I'm talking about strictly revenue. I don't know what that looks like on the expenditure side yet, but as we get closer into the summer, I'll be able to determine that. Uh, so I say this just so you can have a state of affairs of where we're at, what we're looking at, what we're watching. Uh, when we went into budget, I don't think we predicted the Omicron variant and attendance mm -hmm. being this way and virtual going this long. Next year might be a lot different. And it, it's going to be a challenge to do budget because we don't really have good data on our demographics uh, because. We're going to have to just pick a number and try to see mm -hmm. what we're going to look like. So we may have to go back a couple years and look at our trend data, look at our moment, look what ADA should be, uh, and go from there. So some things to consider. I wrote these down. This says we start going through our budget workshops because we'll meet pretty much every month to talk about these things and how we're going to move forward. Uh, the biggest concern I have right now is in two years from now, we have about 49 teachers that are being funded out of ESP. Uh And those 49 teachers need to to be off the books in year three. And so uh, we have to somehow through attrition, whittle that debt number down. I know it does impact campuses and it's, they need the extra help, but at some point the district will not be able to afford to sustain that. And so we're gonna have to come up with a problem, and, and a, a, not a problem, but a solution to how we're gonna deal with that because you can see we're in a deficit and, added, and compounding another 4.3 would not help the, the budget. We have the quiet center opening, so I already know that I, I, you should look up there, based on the staffing model they showed you, it's about $720,000 worth of staff to open that. We've got around $250,000 for the operational budget. That's supplies, that's chemicals, that's the, the electricity. And so we're running roughly almost a million dollars to open that facility starting in, in, in June, June for next year. So that will be a budget item. Cass High School, we were receiving a grant from HEB. We've had it for a pretty long time. They had funded some positions and some stipends there. That was about 350000 Well, that's, this is the last year of that. So that's going to go into the books, and I need to add that to the general fund budget. Uh, and then we have other programs, like the Penguin Project. We have the Fine Arts Academy at Crewell that I don't have budgets for yet. Those could possibly be budget items that we need to add into the budget. Uh, and then, this day and age right now, we're in, a, we're in extreme competition over teachers and bus drivers and custodians. And it's, we're not only dealing with other school districts, we're dealing with the market. So I don't know how we're going to pull it off, but we're going to figure out a way to do, do something computation-wise, and I just put a number in there of what we've done in the past at 2%, 3%, which costs us $3 million. Every time we do that budget item, mm -hmm. that, that percentage is $3 million. That's that of the deficit currently. That is not. This is, okay. we, this, okay. this is going into next year. Okay. Uh, so this is going into next year, what I'm thinking. We're going to, as we walk through our workshops, keeping in the back of our mind, if we're going to do compensation, this is what's going to cost us. If we're going to open the natatorium, which I don't know why we wouldn't, we've built it, so we have to do it. Uh, and if we, uh, Cass High School is open, I've got to pick up those, those salaries. And then we have the Penguin Project. So these are things that, as we're building budget, that I'm going to have to add to our budget. Uh, and then, to put it in perspective, take out the ESSA teachers. Just based on the things that I listed there, Going into next year, we're adding about $4.4 million to the budget if we do a competition plan and, and picking up those other items. Uh, and that's not to say that we need to add staff somewhere else. Um, if we have increases in our in other budgets, as we work through this, we're just going to have to work through it. The bright side is we do have ESSER 2, ESSER 3. The downside of that is going to go away, and we have to be prepared for that. 
down the road. And what year is that? Mm -hmm. So SR SR one, we need to spend by 2023. Twenty two. So I mean, we're going to go through that. So we'll use that up this year and next year. Uh, and then SR three, we got we got till 2024. But we already have 4.2 coming out every year, and then we've been doing their pension stipend out of that. So we're taking about six million off of that every year, and, and that's our plan. So we got to have a plan for that money. And if it gets tight where we need to use it for something else, we may need to pivot and move faster with that those as a green Brandon, I thought for the Penguin project we were going to use some sponsors. We will. I, I I can't assume based on money that I don't have. So if we don't get money, then I'm going to put it in our budget. If we do get money, that only helps. Okay. So I'm not going to. We're not going to not do the budget if we don't get sponsors. So we're still going to consider. Yeah. The, uh, the so we, I put that in there. If we have to put it in there. Uh, and, and usually it's personnel and people that we hire. Yeah. It's hard to like fund it from donors. We don't like to put a salary on somebody that gave us money last year. Uh, and so yeah. And and I think also, you know, we reach out to people like HEV and say, hey, this is where we're staying, you know, and many a times they'll step up. But, but as, as you just said, Brandon, you've got to give us the givens, yes. you know, not the possibilities. And I think uh, in lieu of what we're seeing right now and the differences, is a monthly update enough, Brandon? No, or every, like every down bag, whether yeah, it's nothing's bag, changed or A, B, and C has changed. Okay. Okay. We have the extra funding. That's not changing. I think that uh, our data could change. Like if COVID, if COVID goes away and we're back to normal, this, the data I was showing you is uh, on ADA could change significantly. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we get funds based on kids coming to school. I will say this, but I talked to Dr. Grissom, the senior staff. The push in legislation right now is to have them stop funding us on daily attendance. They need to fund this yeah. in a moment. Because mm -hmm. if you get class has 130 kids, I'm giving them seven teachers for that. Mm -hmm. And whether they come to school every day or not, I still got to pay for those teachers. And so right. the funding mechanism that the state of Texas is using as far as paying us on attendance, sure. we're only, there's only six states in the country that does that. Mm -hmm. It's in the election year. He might give us the answer he took. Correct. <laughs> you know. So what I put on there is a calendar for you all. So this gives you an idea of what the district's going to be doing, the different staff members that we have on this business side and HR side, staffing wise, building budgets, looking at our oh, he has it somewhere. And then every, I'll, probably the biggest high level meeting will be in April when I have a lot of good data because that'll give me the, the next six weeks of data. Uh, but then we'll have kind of the initiatives set it out, like what does the Penguin project look like? What are we looking to do? And so I can start building those kind of budgets to add to what we're doing. So I'll come back every brown bag and give you updates. But really the biggest okay. high level will be April kind of being staffing at that time, looking at campus budgets, uh, knowing what we're getting as far as our, our federal funds, and then we're working till August. Remember, we're adopting the general fund budget in August. Hopefully have a compensation plan if we're going to do one uh, in July, uh, and so that we can stay consistent. So questions for me on this at this point? So I got one. Um, so in, in trying to figure out ADA versus enrollment, you got enrollment which our enrollment is? 13-2. So if it was based off enrollment, they would give me the basic allotment based on 13,200 students. So that's what I'm staffing on. That's what I give the principals the budgets on, how many kids they have enrolled in their campus, in their classes. So the way we build budgets is on enrollment, but the way they pay us is on a daily yeah, attendance. The kids come, so I, I can have 20 kids show up, and I have to give a teacher for that. They're, I only get funding for 15 kids because mm -hmm. the percentage is, yeah. that's how the state pays us. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest issue that a lot of districts are facing. And, and districts that were growing, that was masked by that problem. Districts that always been losing enrollment and losing ADA have been dealing with this issue, but now everybody's dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Attendance across the state of Texas is down everywhere. It doesn't matter where you live. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what we're all continuing. So is this something we need to bring up to legislation to let us oh, figure yeah. out? Mm -hmm. Yes, bring it right up. We have the uh, grassroots coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, next, next Wednesday. Week. Grassroots is a great change. time to bring the question. Up. I'm sorry? Grassroots is a great time to bring that question. Up. I think that change there is really uh, one that everyone needs to get behind and, and really think mm -hmm. forward about how, how we run school. I want to emphasize a few points that Brandon always does a really great presentation. I want to make sure um, that. This is based on us plugging in the numbers we know today. We know the state of Texas is going to do something in revenue this year. We just don't know what that's going to be. Hold harmless or are going to come up with a modified version. We know it's going to be more than what we anticipate because they 
they've asked all ISD, all mm -hmm. 1,100 of us, to stop submitting uh, low attendance waiver dates. They mm -hmm. want to be in yeah. because it's all over. Mm -hmm. um, you just know what it looks like. Well, that, that's going to help. Uh, we have time uh, before we, we fall off this artificial cliff. And we've always been able to do things through attrition. People mm -hmm. voluntarily either leave uh, the district or leave the state or retire out. Uh, we're able to, to merge and, and collapse things and, and make it work without doing a rip, which we never want to do a rip in our district. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't ever have to. We never have to. We also have a lot of rooftops popping up in the mm -hmm. district, which is going to be a big help. Uh, that's going to change some of the picture. Uh, but our picture is a little more steeper than the ones around us. Uh, we, we also do research about where everyone's at. Everyone's in the same position. We're a little further in that position. Um, because we've done things like hire additional staff, hire mm -hmm. additional teachers. We're going to have to be very conscientious about our staffing model for next year, and we're going to have to stick with it. Uh, and that's on the campus. It's also at the district level as well uh, to make sure that we can get to where we need to be within two or three years. So we don't have this, this kind of an issue moving out there. So, yeah. so going on based on enrollment, like if we were to get 13,000, Will we be saved or will we still need to increase our enrollment due to growth? Uh, like, so how much percentage of it will we need to grow with, with uh, so that way our budget can equal out to what we're bringing in? Well, growth is always good. The more, I mean, the more students you get, the more revenue you get. But at the same time, the more students you get, the more expenditures you get. So mm -hmm. I need more teachers, I need more resources, more transportation. And so it's a, it's a give and take, but it's, it, the best part about it I have 13,000 students, but they're only paying me for 12,000. That doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? And so the idea is pay me for my 13,000 that I do have, but mm -hmm. I still got to serve the 13,000, mm -hmm. whether they show up every day or not. Mm -hmm. I Correct. can't just get rid of the teacher. I mean, I can't rehire somebody to come in and, and a substitute. Mm -hmm. the, the students aren't there. We still have to have somebody for those classes because there's still 18 other kids there. Um, so with all this that we're we're adding on to this, like to this, to not rift or uh, to do a rift or anything, what our enrollment would have to be to sustain this? Well, it's again, it's it's not the enrollment. Oh, okay. It's the attendance. Or right. not, I understand yeah. that, but say we wanted to go that route with the enrollment, because I think eventually we're going to get the state, the state to try to turn their head and say, okay, we're going to go enrollment. But I want to make sure we're a little bit forecasting for the. So the way I would forecast for it is if I did enrollment. I wouldn't know exactly what funds I was getting because I'm turning in that number. So I know exactly how I'm going to staff that campus, how much I have a formula that I'm going to give them. So that cleans it up to say, this is how much I know I get. Right now, it's always a projection because I don't know what our attendance is going to be. Mm -hmm. I know what our enrollment is all the time. Yes. I know what, how what they need on the campus all the time because they, I mean, we got the numbers. Yeah. And, and that would be a state finance policy change, yeah. not a number. Oh, you know? okay. it, wanna, it, it would just be... It all depends what service you want to offer. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. So yeah. I'll give you an example. We have 22 social workers in our district, so we have a neighboring district with one. That's mm -hmm. a commitment. That's, a, that's an investment we invest in with our mm -hmm. budget. Um, so it's all contingent. It's, it's not a memory camp out there. It's what do you want to offer services and tutoring and experiences and uh, extracurricular, co curricular. Uh, so there's other ways to mitigate the cost uh, without just sending a number out there. So those are decisions that we we get together mm -hmm. and make for you guys and recommendations and then support it or not. So. And I think we I believe we offer a lot of things that a lot of other districts are not offering. Mm -hmm. You know, we give a lot to our students. We do. We just got to stay uh, cognizant. We have a million dollar uh, swimming uh, center opening. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to make those decisions. Yeah. What do you th on, on that on that note? What do you think the return on investment like like? Are we going to be able to function with trying to put a, a revenue up for our swimming pool to help us get I guess, come up with like half of it, or at least well, to mitigate some of it? I don't. Know what it, I don't know many districts that have it where it's cost neutral. They're always operating in the rail on that. But I mean, investment is good. You could, I mean, more kids are getting to do things. I mean, I don't think we have anything that makes us more revenue. Like free pay for all doesn't make us more revenue. It'll be like a lot of things we do in the district. Uh, the payback's not going to be a dollar. It's not going to be Yeah, it, it's going to be the opportunities our kids have and their, their growth. Yeah. Okay, great discussion. We'll see you next month. Thank you, sir. 2021 2022 Campus Accountability Stories. Yes, sir.
Yeah, we have really incredible principles and we're bringing two examples today and, and it takes a lot. principles as they are able to understand not only the accountability but being able to connect it to the work and so just as last week we had middle school and high school principals and also last week elementary principals who shared their accountability stories and all the great things that they are doing on their campus so we've asked two of our principals to come and share their story their accountability story and with us we have of course Ms. Roxy Freeman from McAuliffe Middle School. Hello um, Roxy Freeman from McAuliffe Middle School while Roger's pulling this up so a few times throughout the year, CNI brings the principals together to share our accountability stories. This has been happening for several years now. I will tell you as a first year principal and now into my fifth year, this has been, this time proves to be the best time to share best practices and learn from our peers, right? So I presented this a few weeks ago to the middle school principals and uh, Lisa Bolte helps give, uh, she gives us a slide deck to frame our thoughts. The first slide deck was just this one simple question. What is accountability on my campus? I thought about that over the weekend. I thought about it, you know, when I was going to sit and work on it. And um, what it boiled down to me, it's just ownership to one word, owning your data, whether it's good or whether it's bad and creating plans around that data. So um, how we own our data, data at McAuliffe is through our data stories, our target cards, our progress monitoring, our tutoring groups, our interventions. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in those a little bit further down, okay? So the way the state breaks up our data, we know is our domains one, two, and three, okay? So looking at last year's data, McAuliffe had a component score of 21 during the COVID year. Moving into this year, we meeting with our campus leadership team and working with the formulas we want our component score to increase by 22 points, bringing it to a 43. How are we going to do this? It's a bunch of numbers, a bunch of formulas. Um, we are going to do this by the goal of getting 70% approaches on all of our meets, 40 on our, um, sorry, 70 on approaches, 40 on meets, 20 on masters. That is on the way to the district goal, goal of the 90, 60, 30, right? We have to kind of take our steps to get there. So that's for domain one. How are we going to do this? How are we going to get to the 70, 40, 20? We have interventions aimed at targeted TEKS. Uh, we're reteaching those TEKS. We are doing after school tutoring sessions, advisory, our accelerated reading program, which also assists with the House Bill 4545, which is a big thing hitting our campuses. And we continue to have our reading support classes, such as dyslexia, read 180, and our IPI. Moving into domain two, that is our historic data. In 2018, we had a 54, 1956. COVID year, we were not rated. So our goal this year is to get a 63, which would be an increase of seven points. Um, we are confident this is gonna happen if we focus on domain one, it's a domino effect, right? The rest kind of takes place. Domain three is closing the gaps, and this really targets our special education students, our at-risk students, and our EL students. This is our data. What is interesting is during the COVID year, we actually met one indicator. And I believe it's all the small groups working with our special ed students, because that's the group that hit it. And it was a lot of virtual one-on-ones, and I think that was impactful. But what's also interesting is in the, in the COVID year, we were in four areas within 10%, in, 10 percentage points in meeting those indicators. So if we continue in the direction we're going, and if we can meet those four areas, then that will bring us from a 7% to a 36% in domain three, which would be an increase of 29 points, okay? So all of this is broken down and reported into TA with our tip plan. But I'm gonna pause there and kind of draw your attention back to what we're doing. What is ownership? What is accountability on us, on our campus? So the first thing I wanna draw your attention to is our student IDs, okay? Our students, we gave every student an ID, and then the back of their ID is the uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline number, which is another conversation. But then underneath it, it has their star target, cord, uh, target score and their level left. Cute story, when I took this from Brandon today, he said, but miss, he was very hesitant to give it to me. And I said, sweetheart, I'm gonna bring it back to you. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it's not that, it's just my scores are not too good. Mm -hmm. And that spoke to, you know, he cares. So this is student ownership. Every math, every core content, rather, teachers provide it with these target cards, okay? 
These target cards we send out to the print shop before the school year even, start, even begins. We get their scores from last year's test. It tells the students what they scored in 2019, 2021, and what their target is for this school year based on the state formula. After each common assessment, after each benchmark, the teacher conducts a student-teacher conference where they write down what they scored, did they hit target, how far away were they from their target. So every teacher does this with every one of the students in their class, okay? On the student level as well, this is an example of their work folder. We progress monitor throughout the year. When you open it up, the student, once they have their conference here, records the same data over here. So if you ask any student at McCulloch, what is your target score, they can tell you because it's behind their ID. Um, and then going back, how am I on time? Okay. So going back, after each assessment, we also have our teachers do exactly what I'm doing, but do it with their peers because that is the best learning, right? We learn from each other. So this is an example of a data story that my eighth grade team put together. They are my highest performing team, so the goal is to get all of my other teachers to reach this caliber. So if you look on that, they show what they need, they move into our goals, they break it down, but what's interesting is that we really utilize the A through F indicator. So if you look at this teacher right here, uh, that was her scores, but then we do a projection. If we were to move six or seven or eight kids more, what would that look like? Here you see that this teacher would move from her D component to a B, which is blue. This formula was shared to me from Anitra Crisp, who got it from a Holdsworth principle. So it's mm -hmm. principles learning and taking from each other, right? Um, and then we identify the areas of concern, right? Well, this is Ms. Holland's area of concern. And then how are we going to attack it? How are we going to attack the, What is our plan? So we shared this as a PLC, a learning community, and we do this after each common assessment. Um, sorry. Oh, Roger, what do they do? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, and um, then moving on. So that's kind of the nutshell of what we do. Um, and then my presentation, we, what we also spoke of in our principal, thank you, Roger. What we also speak to is what are our goals as a principal, but for sake of time, that, um, I'm not going to really go dig too much into detail. But what I want to end with is we also, distinctions are not far from our thoughts. We want to excel. We want Southwest to be put on the map. We want, especially my heart, you know, my heart's at McCullough. I want our kids to know that we are capable of great things, all great things. And I think if you're on my campus, you know that feel, you see that feel, the way I connect with my community, that is the message I give. We are capable of greatness and we're going to achieve it. So with here, we have master's camps, and what's very interesting is on Friday nights, we have lock-ins, right? And um, we allow the kids to come, and these are our students who are hitting the meets in the master's, the ones that want to stay in school, right? They want to be there after school. So we have a science um, master's camp, social studies, algebra one, ELAR. The students stay with us until 6 o'clock that evening. We end the day from 5.30 to 6 with gym time. And... Um, what I thought was interesting is the day that Thursday we closed, not this past week, but the week before that, we had a master's camp scheduled for Friday. We didn't think students were going to show up since we canceled on Friday. No, all of them showed up. They want to be there. McAuliffe is a place to be on a Friday night, right? <laughs> so that is what we're doing. And, um, of course, those are my campus performance objectives, which can be found on my CIP. But that is it. Are there any questions? Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you're welcome Freeman. to look at these, but I have to get them back because I'll be, teachers will be upset and so will students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So we also asked for, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Then we also have our elementary uh, Sun Valley, our principal, Ms. Veronica Wilson. It's okay. You don't have to say the high then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Wilson. Like, yeah, Wilson is easier. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Sorry. Go ahead. So, um, as Roxy was talking about, we do get our slide deck given to us 
and then we're our, we put what we believe our accountability is. And I did write like a statement um, because I felt that it was important for us to kind of discuss this. And I, sorry, but I am going to read this because I think it kind of um, gives everything that we're about at Sun Valley. And so accountability is everyone working hard to meet the goals of our campus. Regardless of what grade level one is teaching or if one is a classroom teacher or a support teacher, we are all responsible for the success or failure of our students. The success or failure of our students is not whether they passed or failed the test, but more about each individual student's growth or progress. Our teachers and our students are continuously working towards being better today than they were yesterday. At SBE, we will focus on learning leaps rather than learning loss. Um, and so that last statement is really important. So I'm reading this book called Leading the Rebound. Um, and that's one of the things that we talk about. We keep keeping to that deficit thinking of talking about, oh, our kids have lost so much, learning loss, learning loss. What we need to talk about is have a more positive approach and say, look at the growth that our students are making. Look at the leaps that they are making. And so at Sun Valley, we've changed the wording that we use, and it's more about those learning leaps at our school versus talking about the learning loss. So this is our accountability data. Basically, in numbers, I'm going to show you um, a different um, table that Lisa had shared with us, but this kind of just gives you a little bit of information as to where we were in each of the domains. Um, this tells, I think, gives us a better picture. This is actually from Lisa. She had given this to us, but it kind of shows um, where our campus has gone. So um, basically, we did take a pretty good dip. Um, we had done so much work, and it's very disheartening to see that um, we took that dip last year, but understanding that this is something that we cannot control. Um, what's important is how we're going to work on each of those areas in order for us to get back to where we were and, of course, growing even more. So I kind of changed the way that I did my presentation because I really thought that it's important that we stick with the priority goals that we have for our campus. And so I led with that instead. Um, and so I wanted to discuss our three priority goals at Sun Valley are analyze and monitor data. We need to make sure that we are constantly looking at our data um, and looking at those data points and ensuring that our students are making those learning leaps. Um, our second priority is supporting our teachers. Uh, we're going to help teachers with planning their instruction to address their unfinished learning of our students. We will do this utilizing resources such as the uh, TRS GAP implementation tool, Get Better Faster protocols, and the use of our academic coaches, who I cannot say enough are instrumental on the campus, both the um, academic and our literacy coaches. And then also, it's about building our teacher capacity, and it's about professional development. That's really important. Um, providing that PD to our teachers in order to build that capacity um, make, to make those learning leaps. We have to plan for instruction, and it needs to be teach focused um, We need to make sure that we're having small group instruction. We need to build on their writing skills. We need the teachers to really have clarity on what their teaks are. A lot of the times, teachers feel that they know their teaks. But as we dig deeper, we see that they really don't understand what those TEKS are. And so it's important for us to facilitate that thinking and have them dig, dig deeper. And then also, too, we have um, a book study that we're working on this year, and it's called the 10 Mind Frames for Visible Learning. And that's all about for the teachers. So the, we start with the um, first one, which is student achievement. And it's about analyzing and monitoring our data. So um, every data point, we will have a data check with our teachers. We, I facilitate a grade level meeting. And we always start with some type of data quote. This, this one is really important to us. Um, and we use it very often. It's not about adding more to your plate. Data is about making sure you have the right things on your plate. Um, you'll see that we share that data with the teachers. <laughs> but the teachers also have to do something with their data. So this real quick is just kind of um, what I present to them is basically the data that I have seen. So that is presented to them. But then teachers have to do something on their own. And so one of the things we do is they do have to have a digital data wall where we're monitoring um, every data point, how they're doing. You'll see they're color coded in a way that correlates with um, approaches, meets, and masters. And then you'll see the students' growth. And the reason we color code them because it's very easy to see when a child has either regressed or actually made progress. We also uh, work on that data collaboratively. So you will see that um, here my coach facilitated a group. And so we're looking at the data across the grade level. 
and they're answering questions. You'll see that, you know, what was a glow in this data and what was a grow? And you'll see on some of those, I'm not going to point this one, the ELAR, one of the grows that they talked about is building stamina of our students. So making sure that our students, uh, because we are transitioning to online testing, is making sure that our students have that stamina. So you'll see some of the answers to those questions. Additionally, though, the teachers are um, doing their own individual data briefs, debriefs. And so what they do is they take their data, and I am a big proponent of, I can give this digital, digitally to my teachers, but I don't. I want them to write it down, because research has shown that when we write it out, it's really staying in our head. And so for this reason, the teachers are required to write it out. When they physically write that student's name in threshold three or threshold two, it's staying in there so they can say, okay, I really need to work with Amy on this thing, or I really need to work with this student. Um, and then you'll see they have different questions also that they're asking. Same thing. So now, though, their glows and their grows are their individual classroom and how their students are individually doing. And you'll see this is an example. I want to show you also on here that we don't do this just with third, fourth, and fifth because they take star. This is across a grade level. So my kindergarten, this is actually a first grade example. They are doing the same thing with the data set that they are given. Um, and we have our students who are also doing this. So we are an AVID school. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. And so our students are also, they have their AVID binder and they create goals for themselves. I had this conversation with this student um, and it was great to see her because she was a little hesitant and she said, "Miss Wilson, I, I went down here and I want to show you that. She goes, I know last year, you know, I scored this much, but you know, this past assessment, um, I scored a 50 and that's actually down, but I know that I'm going to get back up. And you'll see that the students also write a reflection. So when they're uh, right before they take the assessment, they all talk about it with the, with the teachers, and they'll say, okay, this is my goal, this is my action plan, so they plan that out, and then they'll have the reflection time afterwards, and you'll see she put, I feel disappointed, um, but at least, or something, uh, I passed, I passed. <laughs> yes, but I just dropped like 20 points. <laughs> so you see that she's you know, taking ownership of that learning, she's also seeing her, her progress, and then we're hoping that the next set that we're going to see her growth. Um, one of the other things I talked about, this is um, one of my, this is the federal report card that I have gone in there. And I purposely chose this one because I want you to see um, one of the things someone said to me is, why don't you make your academic coach do that data for you? And the big part is no, because I'm the principal of that school. It's my responsibility. I need to do the data myself. And so I will tell them, no, I, I don't want you to do it. I will take care of it. I will do it because it's the same thing. What I expect from my teachers, I expect from myself. And so I make sure to go through the data myself. So you'll just see some notes here that I'm looking at um, to kind of go through and make sure. Uh, we are an additional targeted support campus for special education. And so you see that um, these are some of the things that we're putting in place in order for us to um, get ourselves out of that situation. Um, basically, what it is is that we didn't have the exact percentage of our special education students um, at meets or masters, and you heard that right, special education at meets or masters. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's very difficult for our special education students. But one of the things as we dug deeper and we're trying to figure this out um, is we also know that our start alt kids um, could also accomplish what they call advance, and that does count for meets and masters. And so it's also making sure that not only, not only are we investing in our general education students, but also in our special education students. And so we have a situation at Sun Valley right now where my life skills teacher is on FMLA. And we know that they're getting ready to take their star all test. And we're like, okay, what are we going to do? So one of my inclusion teachers says, no, we need to get one of us in there. We're going to create a schedule. And each one of us is going to take a day that we will be in there facilitating that instruction for those students. Um, you know, that, that's, that goes with our over-compassing thing where these are all of our students, mm -hmm. not just that one classroom teachers. And so they've developed that schedule so that they can make sure that they're providing that instruction to all of those life skills, those life skills students in there. Um, and so that's something that we're also doing. Of course, monitoring them, assigning mentors, and then also making sure that our special education teachers also have PLC time also. These are our Cameron's performance objectives. You'll see 
um, that they are um, pretty much just along the same area. You'll see that I am targeting specifically our special education students and making sure that we try to reach those goals. I can tell you um, at one of the things that we talked about earlier about attendance, and I know Brandon was talking about it too, um, we saw a big, um, in January, attendance was really low and it was very concerning to us. Um, and so we did not take this, the third uh, common assessment that we were scheduled for. However, we just, we said we're gonna do our own. We, we did it, we're taking that interim and we're looking at that data. But I can report to you that it is looking much, much better on campus. <laughs> we were in the 90s this week and I'm like, yes. So I was very happy about that. And so just letting Brandon know that it's, it's on the up. We're getting awesome. <laughs> um, also, the support for the teachers, it's having bi-weekly PLCs weekly grade level planning with the instructional coaches, but then they also have individual meetings with our new teachers and then also with myself. So um, I know that, you know, we talk about, you know, taking teachers conference periods away and stuff like that. I don't have that issue on my campus because my teachers know that what we're doing is going to help them in the end. So, you know, when we say we're available, it's not a you have to. It's, we're going to be available. This is the time my teachers are there and they're showing up. And awesome. I think that speaks volumes. Um, but you'll also see professional development, book studies every year, and then uh, making sure that the teachers have the teacher resources that they feel um, will benefit the students the most. Uh, you'll see also our professional development, the, some of the things that we are doing. Uh, we do a lot of work with Gretchen Burnaby. You can see that my teachers came in the summertime on their own, not getting paid or anything, because they know that it's important and they know that they're going to get some wonderful strategies um, to incorporate into their classrooms. All right, and then um, this is my last um, thing, and I really want to celebrate the hard work that is going on in the classrooms with my teachers, and we need to celebrate them. And this is part of from that book, but it says, when staff feel supported and work in a culture of appreciation, the climate contributes to student learning. And I can't stress that enough. When our teachers are happy and they feel appreciated, then they're gonna go ahead and come on a Saturday training for professional development. They're going to stay after school to plan with each other because they know that they're appreciated. And so these are just some of the things that we do on campus to really help and facilitate that. But I really do feel that once we build that capacity in our teachers, then everything else falls in place. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Mr. President, I think you can see um, two really great examples of really high quality, high flying uh, campus leadership we have. So, I want to thank you, Ms. Freeman, Ms. Wilson. A great presentation. Mm -hmm. I know this is a a, a regular uh, thing with C and I and, and uh, with the C and I subcommittee you guys work with. So, appreciate that. If you can indulge me, uh, I'd like to ask one person to step up. It's not on the agenda. But we learned something this morning, and we would like to make that announcement to the board. So if I can, okay. is that okay with you? Yes. Ms. Marie Phelps, if you can please uh, come forward and make the announcement. Thank you, Dr. Versta. Thank you, members of the board. So every year, it seems like Texas is becoming more and more aware of how not just that, crit that social workers are not just a bonus in the district, but just a very, very critical need, and a very crucial part of our, of our school system. Every year, it seems like more and more districts are recognizing that and are adding social workers to, to their campuses. Of course, we know that our district recognized pretty early on what others are just starting to recognize now. Each year, a very selective and very respected committee reads through hundreds and hundreds of nominations that are admit are submitted each year to recognize one social worker that in their opinion stands you know heads and shoulders above the rest to be the example the leader in in Texas and this year the committee was asked to Select, select someone who has spent 30 years or a lifetime in the role of advocate and servant. The committee was asked to select someone that 
does not make excuses, someone that uh, does not let lack of resources or even maybe lack of knowledge of a particular subject keep him from advocating the best way possible for the students and families. And the committee was asked to select someone that, you know, through this, this is, you know, perilous time, you know, in education, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So we asked that the person to be selected be someone that steps on school grounds every day with just one, one mission, one goal in mind, to, to serve and advocate for the students and families. And we're happy to say that they were very wise this year in, in their decisions. So I'm a big fan of the committee now. But it is, I'm very humbled and honored to recognize and introduce our Texas State, not just San Antonio, but the entire state school social worker of the year, uh, Mr. Roland Cornejo, who served the <laughs> And that's a, the second one in Southwest in yes, how many years? We've only nominated twice. We've won both times. Wow. So, so, wow. That, so that's, yeah. just, that's just who we have. We have Lord, can we give him a chance to uh, say a few words yes. if he'd like? Mr. Please, Cornejo, Rowan. would you like to share a few words, sir? Congratulations well, on behalf of the board. Very, very blessed to be here and be back with the district that I was here years ago. But I'm so happy that the district allows us to do things for free. We try to Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. So uh, we said today we would we would make the announcement. We're going to celebrate this because there's definitely a celebration to be had uh, later on. Uh, we're just okay. getting the news, and we did not. Your guys were happy to come in here, so we want to make sure we we made the announcement. Thank you, Marie yeah. and Roland. It is indeed an honor to have you uh, in Southwest ISD, and thank you for everything you do to change lives in the most positive way. Anything else? That you, you have uh, items uh, in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. This is a really good list. I want to just point out and recognize our mariachi uh, from Southwest High School, Southwest Legacy High School. Uh, they have both made it uh, to Division One rating. They're moving on to state competitions, so we're very proud of them. Uh, we'll give that information when we get it uh, from that that competition, and we'll get it out to our trustees. Like that's going to be in Seguin on. 225 and 226 the end of the month. So, yeah, it's a big celebration for them. Okay. Brandon, did you have one more thing? Well, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about book assignments. Yes, we, we do have on, on your list here, uh, March 9th is our, our growth and planning committee meeting. And uh, I know I sent an email out I want to make sure that we do get a nomination from every one of our trustees uh, and that we we're kind of putting this committee back together with the pandemic and everything. We haven't met in a long time. Um, and so we're trying to address the, the issue to make sure we have representation for every campus, for our PTA president, uh, that all of our principals are part of the committee, uh, that uh, we have three board members who will be part of the committee, and we have a nominee uh, from every board member. Uh, so we think that we're covering the whole district. I don't know what I left out of that, Brandon. We, we plan to bring the instrument to get you guys to kind of approve it again at the, the regular board meeting, uh, February 25th, I think is, is the date uh, this month. And um, we'll have that at first growth and planning on the 9th. And one of the items we're going to bring up is the naming of the aquatic facility so that uh, everyone's aware yeah, of that. First of, can I make a suggestion? I, I brought this up in the past, but I think we had already started the committee um, whenever I would bring it up. But when we say um, the PT president, then if the PT president's not available, then you end up with nobody from that school. Can we say a PTA officer, a PTA officer? That Absolutely. way, yeah. if one person cannot make it, someone else can come in. Because I noticed that we have a, a, a great attendance from our professionals from the district, but our actual parents and community, um, sometimes, you know, we just don't, don't have the numbers we would like to see. Yeah. We'll so change we it just to PTA change member. That. Yes, we can do that, that would be wonderful. Well, there, I actually have PTA president or officer, and so I sent that out to ask the principal for the PTA president or an officer. Right. That way they can get the information about the meeting, right? And, and 
truly, if we don't even have one of those, that we would like to have them bring a representation of a parent. A parent. Um, so that that's like the third. Yeah. So we're redoing, we're starting over on the building, I mean, we're, the growth and plan? We're sticking with the, the, the original framework. Um, some of it's going to be a little bit different, uh, but it's not starting over. Correct. We're keeping the, the members who are still part of it. Um, We'd like to keep them, uh, but there's a lot of vacancies uh, because of change over time uh, that we'd like to fill it up to the 44-member group. Okay, and as far as board representation, I think we need to make sure there's representation from each area of the district, not just all from one area. Yeah. So if whoever's on, I don't know who's on now, but... We're going to have to maybe look at that, and if you know we have somebody from over here now, then maybe that person should be, maybe Daniel's over at Legacy. You know, so instead sure. of all from Big Country or all from the country, let's split it. Yeah. Even on board representation. It's a good point, and we're going to take okay. our, we'll our. take that into consideration. Uh, we'll we'll get those names from Mr. Vasquez, and we'll make sure we. We definitely add them on there. We're just trying to make sure we, we have enough people uh, at the meeting so we do hear voice from every I, one of our school communities. I would like to say that I've been on this committee for all these years, and I would like to remain on the committee. In the past, uh, when I have requested to be on a committee, if not, someone else is not moving out of the position, then there's no room to right. get in, right? So, you know, I, I would like to continue to be on the committee. I understand the concern. But if we want to do that, I mean, we could also just have all the board members come and post it. I'm yeah, not, true. I'm not, uh, I've been in the committee anybody since. Anybody in particular, what I'm saying is now we have Mr. Bernal I agree. who comes from over there. And so maybe yes. we need to have, you know, put him on there. And then we have yes. Daniel that comes from Legacy. Yes. And, and from Big Country, maybe one from Big Country and one. You know, I mean, I'm just saying it's, it's a good since we're... Adding new people to the committee, let's look at the board representation. I'm not, in no yeah. particular, I'm just saying region wise. Yeah, there, there are other options, and um, we can do an alternating thing. Um, we can we we try to stay away from posting, but posting is an option. I mean, there's I think it's whatever you guys collectively agree upon is we just want to know. Uh, but we do want board to be part of that. And just a reminder, it's I understand a, it's, what her concern is as well. But I've been in the committee since before I was even a board member. Yeah, me too. And I'm very good about making sure that I attend mm -hmm. because we've had different people in the past. Sure. I'm the only one that attends, or me and Yolanda mm -hmm. used to attend all the time. Yeah. So yeah. that's some, um, you know, it, it's like you have to but be it, consistent too. Continue. I, I mean, I will, I'll stay, I will go. I mean, if y'all going to be there, that's fine. It's, that's my thing. Like, if y'all represent us. Because to me, right now, everybody represents everybody across the board. So I we're know, from one end to the other. So it's not like yeah. we're, 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 we're all a legacy, blah, blah, blah. We're one end from everybody across the right, board. Right, we're at large. I we're at large. So it's like, y'all want to do y'all? Y'all go do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think what we were looking at is, is because Mr. Bernal was part of that prior to being on the board. And so we, we have four. And so mm -hmm. right now, if we left everything like it was, we'd have to start posting, right? The, yeah. Mm -hmm. With the 72 hour. Um, and, and I hear everyone's problem. concerns and, and I, Lloyd and I will visit on this and, and, and I will make, I will bite the bullet. Well, you know, there was a point yeah. in this okay. committee when Sylvester, myself, Yolanda and Mike were there. Mm -hmm. And as long as we were not well, sitting together, we were all spread out. I didn't, we didn't, we never had a problem with it. We never thought as a group. Well, well, the thing is, the president is a non-voting member mm -hmm. of every committee uh, by our policy. Mm -hmm. So Mike would attend. He wasn't really a member of the committee. He, right, he but we were still all there but, in attendance. Yeah. yeah, so I'll visit all that. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody? Thank you, Brandon. Good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this meeting is now adjourned. What time we got? 125? 125. Más o menos?